for being here this morning. For those of you who did go to the concert last night, I know that it was probably a lot of work to get up and be here. For those of you who didn't, great. That's, <laughs> you're supposed to be here. Um, I'm so happy that y'all came here for day two. I hope you had a great day one. Did you have a good day one at Universe? Good. Before I launch into my talk, there are a bunch of people I'd like to thank. First of all, the GitHub events team, which has done an amazing job of making us all comfortable and welcome. All the amenities, best conference food I've ever had, for sure. Uh, best portable toilets. I mean, can, like, that's just... <laughs> yeah, I give a shout out to the portable toilets. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the people who've been preparing and serving the food, the people at the coffee station, the sound folks in the back who've been working their butts off for several days. There are about 30 people back there who are making us all look good. I want to thank all of those folks. So with that, I'm going to kick it off with a story. When I was 17 years old and growing up on the other side of the bay, in the East Bay, I won a scholarship to travel to Washington, D.C. And it was as far as anybody in my family had ever been. And so I got on a plane, check out my animation, and I went from Oakland to Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. And I'm a civics dork, a real civics geek. So going to Washington, D.C. for me is like, I would imagine bringing, bringing some up-and-coming coder to Silicon Valley for the first time. And I thought, there are a whole bunch of things I really want to see in DC, and I really want to go to the museums. And so coming from a resource-constrained background, I had saved my money so that I could go to museums. There were three things I wanted to see. The three things I wanted to see when I got there at the Smithsonian were the portraits of the presidents, a, a moon rock, and Indiana Jones hat, jacket, and whip. These things I knew were all in the Smithsonian. Now, this was 1989, so there was no internet. I had to do my research and ask people who'd been to the Smithsonian. I had to call the Smithsonian during business hours on a landline with a phone that had a cord into the wall. I had to ask my parents' permission to dial long distance. That's a thing. <laughs> ask your older friends and parents. And I had to call the Smithsonian and say, are these things still on display? I've saved my money. I'm going to come see them. They're at three different museums. And I'm thinking if it costs $10 to get into each, I'm going to save $30. And I'm going to go see these three things when I get to Washington, D.C. For those of you who've been to Washington, D.C., you will imagine my delight and surprise when I got there and everything said this, free and open to the public. Free and open to the public. Now I've got $30 I wasn't counting on in my pocket, and I get to see everything. I spent a week running around that mall, looking at things I never thought I'd be able to see. I saw the Declaration of Independence. Did I see that there? I saw the Constitution there. I think the Declaration was on display. I got to go and see the Natural History Museum. I got to see the National Gallery. I saw the Museum of American History. I saw the space, the Air and Space Museum, and not just once, but I kept going back. I could leave, get a cheap lunch, and come back and see some other stuff and not worry about that price of admission. That was a life-changing moment for me when I really understood what free and open to the public means. And because we're all here because we believe in the power of open source, it's the same thing. Right now, I guarantee there is some 17-year-old kid who's geeking out on the museum of open source. And they're perusing repositories like this one from Glia X, where they have uploaded specs to 3D print basic medical supplies. And there's a 17-year-old kid somewhere who's geeking out on those specs and 3D printing a stethoscope because she can. And she's looking at this going, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And all of this code is what? free and open to the public. This is the power of open source. And when we talk about the future of software development, this is, as we know, because we're here today and we believe in GitHub and we believe in the power of open source, this is how we are going to throw open the doors 
to communities that have never had access to this kind of museum. When I was growing up and coming up and learning about tech, things were locked down. You could not access someone else's code, and you know you couldn't fork it. You couldn't copy anything and make it your own. But now we've got kids who are perusing the equivalent of the National Mall, looking for code, looking for projects, looking to make contributions, in some cases their first contributions, to something that is really impactful and meaningful to them. So what we're doing at GitHub, because we believe so strongly in the future of developers and in the new developer, we're looking at the fact that 60,000 computer science majors graduate in the US every year, but we are anticipating 15 million new jobs, technical jobs, in this country in the next 20 years. That math doesn't work. Okay? If we think we're actually going to see the innovation we want in this next generation, in the next two generations of software development, this math doesn't work. Now, I'm not here to trash a computer science degree. I, I'm sure many of you have very lovely computer science degrees. And wonderful, that's great. Computer science degrees are one pathway to being open source contributors. They are one, it is one pathway. It is not the only pathway. And if I took a poll in this room today, of how many of you are not computer science majors, but are amazing contributors to open source communities, to really cool, innovative technologies, I bet you'd see a huge difference in the number of people who hold computer science degrees, but are here because they believe in open source and learned it somewhere else. You might be self-taught. You might have gone to a coding school. You might have had that one teacher somewhere in a school who said, you've got this talent, you've got this skill, you should just do this thing. Our founder, who you heard from yesterday, left college partway through because he wasn't learning this stuff. He wasn't able to access the stuff at the speed that he wanted to and make it his own. So at GitHub, one of the things that we're really proud of is for any job you apply for at GitHub, there is no formal education requirement, none. We do not look at that pedigree. We do not give it an inordinate amount of weight because you went to a named school. We want to know that you are here for the open source community to build some cool stuff and to be part of this movement that somebody joked on Twitter yesterday. I don't know if you're here, Sarah. Apparently, open source that used to be the outsider were now the establishment. Sarah, if Sarah's here, she tweeted that we're, Sarah May, we're, we are the establishment. Okay, we have to just get over that. Open source is kind of the establishment. But let's be a totally different establishment than the one that came before it, the one that was locked down the one that was not free and open to the public. What we're doing at GitHub is we are actively investing in new developers. So this is a program that we've been running for a year in partnership with Housing and Urban Development and a nonprofit called Everyone On. If you were here at Universe last year, you heard from their CEO, Chike Agu. We are working with 28 communities around the US and investing in young people who live in public housing. So that means they are living at or below the poverty line according to US standards. And we are bringing digital literacy to their uh, computer centers, to their homes, connecting them to the internet with partners like Comcast, and saying, look, we believe in you as the creators of the next generation of software. This is not, please do not mistake this for charity. Please do not mistake this for philanthropy, even though technically it is. This is a massive investment in the new developer. We are looking at a lot of these young folks and their families and saying, how quickly can we hire you? What are your plans for your life? Do you want to be in software development? And when Toya East, who's sitting here in the front, she's pictured there on the left, she runs this, pro this project. When Toya asks them, you can raise your hand, Toya, in case anybody wants, wants to ask you questions later. <laughs> when Toya asks them on their surveys, what did you like most? They said, we like building. We like building things. I think if I polled this room, that would be one of the things that we would hear too. We like building things. We like building cool things, either that nobody's ever seen before, or I would guess that in this room we also like to build a lot of replicas. Everyone has the secret Millennium Falcon in their closet that they built out of Legos. I'm no exception. Investing in new developers, that is what GitHub is doing. So every time we partner with a black girl's code, every time we partner with Code 2040, we are investing in the new developer. And your call to action today is to invest in the new developer. One of the most magical things we've learned in Connect Home is that this little $99 kit 
from Kano. There's a British company. It's a bunch of, uh, it, it runs on a Raspberry Pi, and it's a, it is often these young people in Connect Homes, their first computer. And the first thing they get to do with that first computer is put it together and understand and learn what the components are and make it do something. Because if you ask kids right now, most kids from any background, what is the computer? They'll point to the monitor. But in our lessons, they start to learn that the Raspberry Pi is the thing that's doing the work. And they hold it in their hands, and they snap it together, and that's their favorite part, building the computer. And the lesson that we work really hard to teach them is, you run this machine. This machine doesn't run you. Let us explain to you what's happening in open source development because you run the software. The software doesn't run you. And this is a whole new paradigm for people who are learning about software development from underrepresented backgrounds. I would like to bring up a, my first guest to talk about another community that's, that's uh, investing in new developers, and we're investing with them. But first, a video to introduce him. Hi, I'm David Molina, former US Army captain and founder and executive director of Operation Code. In my last year of active duty, I applied to Code School, excited because I got in, but then disappointed that I couldn't use my GI Bill benefits to pay for tuition, room, and board. A few months later, during my exit off active duty, I was frustrated to learn there were no readily accessible software development education, mentorship, and job placement opportunities for those of us who had worn the uniform and wanted to transition to software careers. That's when I connected the dots and launched Operation Code. I support Operation Code so that people like myself, veterans, can go to coding school. It's a great resource for returning vets who really need that extra leg up. Because it helps not only the individuals that it might provide scholarships for or mentorship, but it helps those people continue to give back to the community. Good morning. Thank you, Nicole, for the wonderful uh, introduction. I am David Molina, founder and executive director of Operation Code. Uh, the gentleman that you saw in the video, Marco, went to Portland Code School, uh, got a job as a software developer. Uh, Victor, my brother, uh, was working in construction, went to a code school, and he doubled his salary, doubled his wages, and he loves what he does. It was painful to realize that one, myself, of 250,000 of sons and daughters, of American sons and daughters who exit the service annually, annually. When I exited in 2013, I could not use my education benefits to attend Flatiron or Dev Boot Camp or Code Fellows for that matter. I could not use the education benefits that I had served over a decade in uniform, both as enlisted and as an officer, and use it. So what is one to do after they buy a home, a VA home? Went back to Portland. And I started a business, as many other would hustle. And I started a company to send myself to code school, and I self-taught myself, attending RailsConf, attending Ruby meetups. And through the love of the open source community, it is why I am here on stage with each and every one of you. Thank you. We drive our philosophy and our vision statement from President Abraham Lincoln at the throes of the Civil War when a country had fallen apart and he was putting it back together, he argued at the second inaugural for malice towards none, for righteous towards God, and he argued that we must take care of those who have borne the scars of war, those who have served our country and their widow. 250,000 of us exit annually. Veterans unemployment is still one too high. Veterans suicide is one too high. And most certainly, and is visible on the streets of San Francisco, veterans unemployment is all too high. Our story began in August of 2014 as an open source project. I launched this website at Cascadia Ruby with another Rubyist, and Operation Code was a two different websites. One was a Ruby on Rails, because I knew that, and one was LaunchRock to collect the data. We pulled in the data, and within days, another developer, Dr. James Davis out of Louisiana, jumped in, in GitHub, emailed. I didn't know what I was doing. 
But I knew that what we were doing now wasn't enough and we needed to do more. And Dr. Davis did something that took me two years in the making to think about in two hours and he combined the two databases and integrated the onboarding process for military veterans to join Operation Code, to petition Congress to expand the GI Bill to include code schools, and he did it in two hours. What took me two months, two years thinking about this and wanting to be a software developer, it took him two hours. And thus, Operation Code was born. At Operation Code, we serve over 650 vets within Slack, the most unique software mentor protege program. I'm taking the skills that I had learned at Ruby Meetups, taking the skills that I learned at RailsConf, at Calligator, Portland's tech community and open source calendar, and sort of taking these things, these things that I had learned with hack hands and hacking with others and pairing with others, and we took this all to ensure that no veteran in the 21st century would be left behind. OperationCode.org is an open source project. Uh, we also have many other. We have over 23 repositories, including open troops. We teach military veterans within our community using Screen Hero, using Google Hangout, Skype, whatever tool that the software mentor would like to use, whatever tool the veteran would like to, to use. And we get them hacking on operationco.org, making them the first commit, one commit at a time. It is a very, very powerful thing when you help a former 82nd Airborne paratrooper who wants to build a website for his son's soccer team to hack a website together. Now, many of us contribute to open source on Fridays, and our companies allow us. For Operation Code, we're in a new mission because we know that the statistics are all too high for homeless veterans, for suicide, and for unemployment. At the end of the day, we're here to fill the nation's technical talent shortage with our nation's finest, American sons and daughters. A show of hands, how many of you have ever, your grandfather or your parents ever served in World War II or in Vietnam or Korea? Show of hands. Please stand up. Show your, please stand up. To, if, on behalf of Operation Code, does no one thank your family for your family's Sacrifice for your sacrifice, thank you. Over half the room, thank you. Generations before us in World War II, our grandparents who served in World War II in Europe, defeating fascism, returned to a grateful nation. Over a third of the country had served and returned to a grateful nation that welcomed them in arms and said, thank you for your service. And not only that, here's an education benefit to put you through the Henry Ford Institutes, to work at the Henry Ford plants, and to be part of the middle class. That was World War II. And over the last 75 plus years, we have fallen and fallen behind. The statistics speak for themselves. Today's middle class, today's white collar jobs, today's jobs that guarantee that aren't going to go anywhere is software development. It is eating the world. During that time, they received education benefits, housing benefits. They can go to school and be part of the middle class. Today, across the country, only five, six code schools accept the new GI Bill to include code schools. We heard from Nicole, there's more than one way to become a software developer, more than one way to become an open source contributor. Code Schools is one of them. How can you get involved? How can you get involved to ensure that today's military veterans thrive, that they're welcomed much like our World War II veterans? It is not enough just to thank them, not just enough to buy them a beer at the airport, not just enough to walk by them and say nothing. They have served our country, and they deserve a real shot at the American dream, a real shot at filling of the many jobs, tech jobs that exist here in San Francisco, across the country, in Portland, and around the globe. Number one, you can become a software mentor in our Software Mentor Protege program. We have over 50 mentors from Java to JavaScript to Python to Ruby on Rails to Go. You can become a mentor in our community 
and start pairing with the military veteran today. It is simple to join. It's operationco.org, and you'll get welcomed by Rick. So you'll get two emails. One is from our welcome mailer in our Rails, and the other one is our Slack bot. We're actually recreating it in VetSpot off Ubo. And you get into Slack. Uh, that is the first way, and it is a very important way, because they've already served their country. There should be no reason they should be paying a dollar, two dollars a minute, or paying for some of this. They've already served their country. The other way is we need volunteers. Operation Code started as a petition. Last year we had a fiscal sponsor, and today we're a 501c3. But in reality, we run like a lean startup, and we're bootstrapped. So we need the best and brightest in this room and watching in their browser to join us on board committees, from public relations to writing, to writing the stories of our veterans, non-coding volunteer positions. All of those are important. Because at the end of the day, if we are to fill the nation's technical talent shortage, we cannot do it what we've been doing thus far. 250,000 exit the service annually. We intend to fill the nation's technical talent shortage with our nation's finest. You imagine if, you're, if your grandparents had come back after World War II, but think of today, what they would think that GitHub and the open source community stood for them to ensure that they were not only taken care of, but at the end of the day, they had a viable career into the future that changed the world. And the third way, by contributing, by donating. We have many, many ways you can donate. We're on Amazon Charity, employee-employee relations through Benevity, matching program. Those are all phenomenal ways. But at the end of the day, we just need more people to step up. We need more open source contributors to step up and ensure that our finest have the best opportunity and best chance today, not tomorrow. You can reach us on Medium, GitHub, and on Twitter. Thank you very much. It's been a privilege and honor. All right, so your first call to action, can you help Operation Code be as impactful as they want to be for a group of folks that are sorely underrepresented in tech and underrepresented in the workforce overall? That's your first call to action. When you think about David's story, and you think about what this means free and open to the public, David talked about learning himself how to do some things that he didn't think he could do and that he didn't know how to do when he first started. A lot of that happened around dabbling and getting in there into those free resources and making something of them. So when we are charged with making something free and open to the public, as I said at the beginning, that's great. Here's the downside. Sometimes the public isn't that great. <laughs> free and open to the public means it's free and open to everyone. And one of the things that we see happening is that Free and open to the public doesn't mean that everybody has an equal experience once they get into open source. So where I want to take this next is to some work that we're doing here at GitHub that we'd like to um, invite you to join us in. The first one is that in, in the fall, we're going to launch the open source survey. There has never been a survey of this magnitude to find out what your attitudes are about open source. How did you get there? Who are you? Where are you? What do you do in open source? One of the things we're trying to do with this survey is figure out how to make this a welcoming, inclusive, and safe space for all people to reap the same kinds of benefits in open source that some people have in, this last, in these last few years. We know that it is not an equal experience for everybody who comes on. So please follow the open source survey when it launches. I ask you to take a little bit of time. Our data science team is working really hard on this. Franny and Arvon, thank you so much for the leadership you've shown around this, because GitHub is in a very unique position to get a wide range of developers in open source answering the set of questions. It'll be the first survey of its kind. So please bookmark that. Sign up when you go to that, that page. You can sign up to get um, a notification when the, the survey is launched. Let your other friends and colleagues know that we need this information so that we can continue to create a space that is open to the public in a way that is meaningful and safe for all people. Another thing we've done is put a lot of time and investment into our own community and safety team. And those of you who saw Danielle Leong's speech yesterday talking about the kinds of tools and the kinds of ways that our team, led by February Keeney, is putting together 
tools and resources and information so that people can feel like open source is a place for them. GitHub needs to be a place for everybody. When I say everybody, I mean everybody, everybody. GitHub needs to be a place for everybody, and we're just not there yet. We can be perfectly honest, we're just not there yet. But we are trying to put the resources and the ingenuity and the data behind us to get to a point where open source is a place for everybody. Um, I would like to bring up a friend of mine who knows a lot about this topic. And Dr. Courtney Ziegler, who is the co-founder of BSM.co, as well as the co-founder of TransHack, is someone <laughs> TransHack is someone who, who has put a lot of time, energy, and his PhD into helping make technology overall an open and welcoming space for all people. And he's going to talk to you today about specifically what open source has done in that regard. So please help me welcome Dr. Courtney Ziegler. Oh, that's me. That was awesome. I heard someone go, you trans hack, woo woo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today, Nicole. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talk a little bit about my journey in, in open source and kind of the stuff that I've done so far in the tech industry. And yeah, so let's get going. My name is Courtney. Um, I am the co-founder of BSM.co. I really appreciate these slides. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit like, <laughs> everything's like so much. Uh, I'm the co-founder of BSM.co, and we are a software company focused on building tools for adult education. Um, I'm one of those people, I guess Nicole kind of alluded to in the beginning, I, though I spent years and years and years in school, um, I do not have a CS degree. Actually, what's funny, um, when I, my first time I went to college, I went to UC Santa Cruz, I was a computer science major. And I spent, I think, a quarter, it's a quarter system, a, a quarter in computer science, and I dropped out. Um, and I studied film. And it was, it was actually really interesting for me to reflect on that moment because I remember um, just feeling like I couldn't be a computer science major. Um, it was impossible for me. I, there was no way that I would be able to participate uh, in the computer industry, what, what I thought it was when I was younger. Um, and so that really, it really intimidated me. And so I was like, I can't do this, um, F computer science. I'm going to, I'm an artist, I'm going to do film. And so that's what I did. Um, yeah. But one of the beautiful things that I think about being, it, not, not going to computer science and um, focusing more on film, kind of humanities-based work, was that I was still kind of introduced to open source. I still found a way to kind of find out how to be a part of an open source community without uh, being a computer science major, um, without kind of being in the industry in that, in that capacity. Um, so my first introduction to open source was actually WordPress. I started blogging as a graduate student because I needed to find a place to kind of get away from the seminar space, um, traditional education spaces, and kind of build community in another way. And so I started blogging in the early 2000s prior to Twitter <laughs> when blogging, like in the early 2000s, blogging was like a big deal. Um, I don't know if any, if any of you are like early bloggers. Uh, my co-founder considers me a kind of early internet pioneer, so I really honored that title. <laughs> um, so I started blogging in the early 2000s. Uh, as you can see, that's the kind of that's a screenshot of my own blog. I had to actually go on the internet uh, way back machine to find this. Um, it's called Black Academic, and this was 10 years ago. So I'm a 25-year-old student. I'm no longer 25. <laughs> um, but it was a really great experience in terms of building a community online. Um, at that moment, WordPress had the infamous, or uh, famous infamous, I see it, as five-minute install, which was really not five minutes. Um, and me not being a computer science major at the time, it was a little bit difficult for me to kind of like set up my blog. But the beautiful thing about it being open source, I was able to kind of find communities online and get help with that. Um, also, aside from the technical support, I was able to find a community in terms of networking. Um, running my blog for about, I would say, almost 10 years that I did, um, maybe eight years, actually, eight to 10 years, um, that I was able to build networks with people that I kind of can still, still, keep in still keep in contact with today, excuse me, um, through my blogging. So it was very helpful in terms of being able to be introduced to the open source community technically um, and as a networking opportunity, meeting different people. Fast forward to 2014, um, 
I was still being involved, still blogging, still being involved in open source, source communities and using different technologies. Um, but I'm also was running an organization called TransHack. Um, I am the founder of that. And TransHack is started off as a hackathon speaker series focused on providing visibility to trans people. Really has grown into kind of a hub in the tech industry to go to uh, a space where trans people can meet each other, um, find one another so that we're not alone in this space, um, find employment with one another, um, support networks that kind of didn't exist before. TransHack has really launched conversations in tech, specifically about gender diversity that didn't exist before. So it's really exciting to kind of be a part of that. Through this journey, I was able to meet my co-founder, Tiffany Michael, who, has been, who is a software engineer and has been a developer for over 10 years. And she met me through co-organizing a trans hack in Chicago. And she was like, let's start a company. And I was like, OK, let's do it. Um, and we are both, I come from a tr traditional education background. She comes from a self-directed, self-guided, um, non-traditional background. But we both held education and the possibilities of education kind of in a high regard. And so she's like, let's work together. I'm like, great. So we were like, what are we going to do? We wanted to build an educational platform that focused on marginalized learners, specifically people of color. It really meant a lot to us because we had very traditional, very different um, educational paths. We definitely wanted to see ourselves represented in, in the space of online education. So we're like, how do we start building that? So we kind of took that initiative to do it. And one of the beautiful things about it was that because we are a two-person team, we started off as a two-person team, really, really small startup, uh, we didn't have any money. And so what really helped us to build our MVP was open source technologies. Um, as you see in this uh, screenshot, of, all the way to the left is our first kind of platform we built, which is a virtual conference platform. Um, and this was in 2014. And we hacked it together using WordPress, uh, some open source, an open source uh, chat plugin, um, Google Hangouts. Um, I think I even used GIMP <laughs> to design the graphics. Uh, everything was like pretty much free and open source. Um, but it gave us the, the ability to, to mess around with it, play around with it, try different possibilities, um, different experiments, work with different customers to kind of test to see what they want and see what we can provide, and just really just try different things. As you see in the, um, the kind of lower bottom right, the woman who's giving instruction, that's at the University of Illinois. They used our MVP to provide uh, educational delivery for potential students who, who may have questions or you know, wanted to participate in the university. And so we were really, again, got an opportunity to find out how can we use, how can we make online learning more engaging um, and more inclusive of different types of people and different types of learners. So again, we had multiple iterations. Um, during this time, as TransHack was you know, still running on its own, we were like, TransHack would be a great customer to really try to leverage what we're building. So we're like, OK, great. How do we take the months that we spent um, on design, figuring out how to make education more than just turning on a video, um, how to in integrate learners in the space? Um, and so we held a virtual conference August 28th, which was the kind of first tech conference for trans people. Um, which was really, really cool, and it was all online. Um, we had about 25 speakers from four different countries participate um, on our platform. And while we really were excited to try the software in action, we were really, again, excited to, to get feedback to figure out how do we make remote learning more engaging? Um, how do we be more inclusive of people who um, come from different backgrounds, uh, speak different languages, uh, are connecting through different kind of internet speeds, um, different things like that. So how can we kind of accommodate all that? And so we tested it out. We had a conference, which is really awesome. And as you can see from the, some of the screenshots, this is what, uh, I guess I can't go back. I can't go back. Oh, sorry. Um, so as you see from the beginning, from the kind of hack together WordPress to like all these different iterations, this is what it looks like today. Um, the platform is called Aerial Spaces. I forgot to say the name. Sorry about that. Um, the platform is called Aerial Spaces. And we did a customized in inst installation, a customized instance of Aerial Spaces for TransHack called The Loft. And it's really a space which we're focused on educational collaboration for trans people. 
Cool. So I'm almost running out of time, which is great. Um, so what we learned, <laughs> what we learned by having the online conference, working with multiple uh, customers, and leveraging open source technologies to really hack together this MVP to take it all the way to proprietary code is so many things, and we're super excited to continue moving forward. One of the most important things is that we were focused on is how to make things accessible. Um, again, how to bring in people who have different internet speeds, um, who uh, have access to different, different types of browsers, different technologies to, in which to like, engage or access their learning. Um, we're also focused on how education online can be more engaging. Um, this is a qu quick story. So we have a customer who is a long-term educator, and he used our platform last week, and he was like, I want to see, see all my students. Because when we're in the, on site, I can see all your faces. And for him, it was like, I need to see their body language. I need to see how they're interacting with the material, which was great. Um, and so we customized his space for that so he can do that. But once he was in the middle of his, once he was um, giving his, uh, his course, he realized that being on stage and being in a classroom in front of people is very different, and that you can carry this kind of emotional connection that you make with people in a virtual space, but you won't necessarily be the same way. You maybe can't see people's faces. Um, you maybe can't see their body language. You maybe can't see when they're confused about something. But then how do you engage them in different ways? How do you create, create technology that allows them to ask questions, that does center the learner, um, that does center people who, who learn differently? And so the final thing we learned is true represent representation. Um, we are really excited that our platform is being used um, across the country now. Um, by GitHub as a customer, yay, GitHub <laughs> for that. Um, so we're, be we're being able to test it with different, different companies and orgs and who are providing online education and getting feedback, and those folks who are centering marginalized people, people who look like me, um, people who are the people that Nicole mentioned in her talk, who are the new developers, different types of learners. Um, you can support us. I think this is my last slide. Yes. But you can find me um, on Twitter. I'm fake rapper. You can follow me there. You can support Transhack, transhack.org, T-R-A-N-S-H-A-C-K.org. Um, you can also visit bsm.co. And thank you so much. I look forward to If you have any questions, find me around. I'll be here all day. So thank you. OK. So you've heard a lot about what is happening in communities that aren't even represented in this room in great numbers. My call to action for you today is to think about what we can do together if we were able to connect every developer in the world and build systems to connect every new developer. Right now, there's a kid sitting somewhere. Maybe it's Kansas City, one of our, our favorite places to go for Connect Home. Maybe it's somewhere in, I don't know, the outback in Australia. We don't know. But that kid is sitting on some amazing idea and needs a little bit of help, a little push, a little bit of mentorship to stay connected to all of the cool things that are happening in open source. You, as folks who are in the middle of it, you as folks who understand GitHub, who understand open source, and who understand the future of software, your job, our job together, is to stay connected to those new developers as well as to each other. Because if we do not clear pathways to open source for people from all over the place, we are not going to be able to reap the benefits of this group of the most diverse, largest generation the world has ever seen. Millennials now coming into the workforce are, I'm going to say it again, the largest, most diverse generation the world has ever seen. And if we lock out certain parts of their talent and don't leverage the best of open source, we will lose answers to some of the world's biggest problems. Our job is to build the future of software together with people who don't even know they belong in it yet. I'm going to give you very concrete things you can do. The first, this is a very basic thing, and I love this site. It's called Your First PR. Do you remember your first pull request? How many people remember their first pull request? Were you petrified? I was petrified. I was petrified. Some, some scary engineer was going to come out of the corner somewhere and be like, ah, you screwed that up. It didn't happen. In fact, people were really nice to me. And people said, oh, and I did screw it up. I want to be honest. My first pull request was not pretty. 
And they said, oh, I see what you did there. Let me help you out with it. And you know what? The second one was less scary, and the third one was less scary, and now it's a part of my everyday life. Same thing goes for you. And the same thing goes for some vet who's sitting in a code school right now, in Operation Code, going, oh my gosh, I'm, this is my first pull request. Please help me not screw it up. You're the ones who can help make that less scary. So please go to your first pull request and check that out and volunteer to mentor somebody who's actually opening their first pull request today. Another thing you can do, this is a project that's work, that uh, is run by a woman named Elizabeth Barron in Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi, Elizabeth, who's watching. She's on the social impact team. Patchwork is one of the hidden gems. I think a lot of folks don't know about it in GitHub. We actually have meetups for newbies all over the world. The next one is on September 30th in Ciudad Juarez. And we help people get their first commit square. And the way we do that is through volunteers, people who are not necessarily GitHub employees, coming to the meetup and walking people through their first commit, and then helping them through the next part, helping them through the next part, and hopefully getting them hooked on this free and open to the public idea so that people can dabble in museums that they didn't know existed. So please volunteer for a patchwork. And the last thing you can do, I'm going to reiterate the open source survey. We need your brains on the open source survey. We need your colleagues to participate in this as well so we can understand what's really happening inside open source. I'm going to end with a story. This happened, I don't know, last month, last month in Amsterdam. I was with my colleague, Lika Bone, who's in Amsterdam right now. She's also watching. Hi, Lika. And we're working in Amsterdam on a project to help support refugees from the Syrian conflict. And the Netherlands, you, you may know, is a place where a lot of Sy displaced Syrians have ended up. And I got to have dinner with a whole bunch of folks who are working on behalf of Syrian refugees, including a Syrian refugee himself. Very young man, about 24 years old, and we're having dinner, and we're talking about what this project could look like and how cool it would be to really get Syrian refugees in the Netherlands connected through GitHub and other methods. And I asked him about his background, and he said, well, I had just started my, um, I had just started my career in software development in Damascus when I was displaced. And I said, oh, I don't know if you know the company I work for. It's called GitHub, and he laughed. And he said, this 24-year-old young man, a Syrian refugee, said, how could I be a software developer if I didn't know what GitHub was? And I said, that's a really good question that I didn't know was a question. <laughs> and it made me feel like the world of opportunity that we have, not just as GitHub, that's cool, but as the open source com uh, community, has no limits to connect to each other right now, to connect to the new developer, and to build the future of software together. We're going to host here in San Francisco in early 2017 a group of Syrian refugees who are also software developers. And we'd like to invite you to come to our office, if you're interested in doing this, to meet with them to talk about what they're trying to hack up. What do they need? What are they experiencing as displaced people in the Netherlands? This is the kind of software we can build together in a way that the, the world has never seen in its history. The amount of connectivity, the level of diversity, and the level of thoughtful collaboration we can actually have together can be unparalleled. That's your charge leaving here today. Thank you so much for being at Universe. I have, we're, there are two speakers coming up after me, so please sit tight. But thank you again for sitting and listening. Thank you, Courtney and David, for your time. And I really appreciate you all spending your day here with GitHub at Universe. Yeah.